Man, that was a long bumper video. I felt like at this point, the lights are up. I should probably just dance for these people. But anyways, I want to welcome to everyone who's joining us here in the room. And you might be joining us online at one of our microsites here in Virginia Beach. It might be in Williamsburg, Fort Johnson, Louisiana. We've got, can't forget, let me look at my notes. Chesapeake at night. Can't forget Chesapeake at night. Soon to be Suffolk, soon to be Pennsylvania, I think. Or maybe you're just checking us out on Line. Can everybody here in the room make those joining us on the other side of that screen feel welcome? Well, today is an exciting day because we are near the end of an amazing series. And by the way, if we haven't, had, haven't met yet, my name is Adam. I get to be one of our pastors here at Man. I get to lead our middle school to college students, and I am going to put in a very intentional, shameless plug. Everybody say August 24th. August 24th is our 412 student conference. Now, you might be wondering, what is 412 student conference? Well, if you're a middle school to high school student, we've got a full free one-day event happening that Saturday, August 24th, where you're going to be able to do some team versus team competition. You're going to get some free food. Anybody like free food? Amen. Come on, the church said amen. That's why we came here, right? Anyways, we got a bunch of outrageous fun planned just for you, but on top of all the fun that we have planned, I really believe, if you really want to believe with me, I believe God wants to meet with you. I think God wants you to experience him. And you might be even wondering as a teenager at 11, 12, 13, all the way up to 18, can I even experience God? Yes, you can. And so don't forget then to register for 412 Student Conference. Parents, this is the only time I will subscribe to forcing your kid to come to a church event. That's how much I believe in this. So parents, if your kid doesn't sign up, if your student doesn't sign up, you don't forget August 24 is 412 Conference. But back to our focus here today. We have been in a series called Summer at Manna, and we've been spending the last six weeks discussing from different communicators from this house this idea of how do we build our faith? Like, faith is an important thing for us as Jesus followers. So over the summer, instead of taking vacation from our faith, we want to focus in. What are just some practical things that can help us focus in on building our faith? Why? Because at the end of the day, Stephen said it perfectly last week. Was that last week? Yes, it was last week. I'm getting it all mixed up. There have been so many good messages. The focus of faith is Jesus. It's not coming to more services. It's just not making sure you're reading your Bible more or talking through this thing called prayer to God or singing some songs on the radio while you go to work. It's about getting you closer to Jesus because he's the one who went on the cross for you and for me. He's the one who laid his life down and paid the price that our mistakes owed not church, not the pastor, not all these great activities that we get to do to get closer to him. It was him. It's always been about him. But who knows that faith is not a passive thing, right? It's kind of like working out. You're not going to just wake up one day and have a six pack, right? You've got to actually put in some work. You've got to actually put some actions into movement. Faith is not a passive thing. So if we're going to get closer to Jesus, we've got to figure out just some baby next steps we can take to get closer to him. And so all this talk about summer and training and building our faith has actually gotten me to go back to my teenage days when I was a student athlete. We have any other athletes here this morning, any sports fanatics? And I thought we were going to have a few more than that. Maybe it's just, we got some guys who love to be active. You can tell they're walking around with the big chest over here. It's like, hey. 
Here I am. But no, no, all this talk about summer and training has got me going back thinking when I was a soccer player. The real football, if I can say. Not some of this, Amer- I know I just offended half of the community. You're closing your ears for the rest of this message. But no, I played the game of what we call here in America soccer. And I got to ask, does anybody remember summer training? Like, like, was this a thing you had to do in your sport? Maybe not for the football players. Maybe you didn't have to train over the summer. But you know what we had to do as soccer players? We had to show up to this thing called summer training. And I'm not going to lie. Early on in my career, I did not like summer training. Why? Because we found out very quickly summer training as a soccer player meant this, running. (laughs) Coach, we're going to work on some passes today? No, get on the line. We're going to do some more sprints. Coach, are we going to practice on shooting today? No. Get on this line. We're now going to go run a couple miles. Coach, come on. Can we just like get a water break? I was watching Remember the Titans last night. You remember that scene? Water? Water is for cowards. Get back. We're going to do up downs till so-and-so is no longer thirsty. We had to run so much as soccer players in summer training. The second reason why we didn't like summer training was this. It was over the summer. I'd rather be chilling. I'd rather be playing video games with my friends. And it was so hot. Oh my goodness. I was playing soccer in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And I thought when me and my wife moved up here three and a half years ago, we're going to get away from this crazy humidity. We're going to get away from this crazy heat. But Virginia, you guys tricked us. It made sense. We're going up north. It gets colder, right? No, it stays stays just as hot. Summer training included a lot of running and included a lot of heat. And so it gets to the point, right? You're, 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 you're running the 50th mile for summer training and you begin to think these thoughts, hey coach, could like, we just take like a day off? Like you begin to think because of the heat, it starts making you go a little bit crazy. You know what coach? I think you actually owe me a day off. But do you want to know something? I don't remember when. I know it was early on in my soccer career, and I don't remember which coach drilled this into my head. But I learned very quickly this lesson. Summer training is not an option. Summer training is not an option. In fact, our coach told us If you miss summer training, you should expect to not play as much throughout the season. Why? Because I can remember it like I was there yesterday. Coach said, Miss Jenny, coach said to me, if I can't count on you now to come to summer training, how am I going to count on you to show up when it really matters? If we were 100% a dedicated team member to this team, we understood then that summer training is not an option. Now, if you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write this down. I entitled today's talk, It's Not an Option. It's not an option. Now, let's talk about options a little bit before I hop into the Word today. If you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to Matthew 28. But before I get there, let's just clear something up real quick. Options, you know, they're not a bad thing. In fact, options can be a very good thing. Um, Thank God, when I moved here to Virginia, we had options for a home to buy because some homes were better than others. Or maybe think about when you go out for a restaurant. There are options, right? Like, thank God we have options. Or maybe you've been at this point or you're about to enter this point of your life. You're trying to figure out what you want to do for the rest of your life. Thank God there's some options. So options aren't a bad Thing. Like, I'm not going to stand up here 
and then say we all need to condemn this concept of options in life. I just gave us a few examples of why options can be a good thing. What I've learned in the last 29 years of my life is, though, options can sometimes have negative results. For example, every single day, right, we have the option to work out or not work out. And if you can tell, for some years, I chose to wake up and not work out. But I'm hopping back in, baby. You're going strong for months. We're getting back to soccer player Adam. Hey, yeah, come on. The church said amen. But every day, right, we have the option to eat something healthier, maybe like a grilled chicken salad, some steak with some asparagus, or we have the option to eat something not as healthy like McDonald's, some Taco Bell, some fast food. We love our fast food here in America. Right, we either have the option to wake up earlier in the morning, spend time with God, or we can hit the snooze button and we'll try to get with God sometimes, sometime later. Again, options aren't a bad thing, but if we aren't too careful, I wonder if we will begin to make certain things optional that weren't ever supposed to be optional. I wonder if there are some things in my life, if there are some things in your life that you have made optional that were never designed to be optional. Everybody say, it's not an option. Well, what am I getting at now this morning? If you got your Bibles open, Matthew 28, we're going to start reading from verse 18. This is uh, a very... Uh, what do I want to say? Famous, that's the word, famous portion of scripture that we have as followers of Jesus. And beyond the fame, it is one of the most foundational portions of scripture that we have in the Bible. Um, maybe you're new to church, though. Maybe you don't know what we're about to read. So let me lay some context of what we're about to pick up in verse 18. This portion of scripture is known as the Great Commission. Everybody say the Great Commission. The Great Commission. The Great Commission was given by Jesus after days before he had died, gone to the cross for you and for me. But three days later, after, like he promised, he rose back from the dead, securing new life for you and for me. And so what happens after he raises from the dead is he actually has two women who are at his grave to go tell his closest followers, the remaining 11 disciples, to tell them that he is alive like he said he was going to do, and that they need to search for him, look for him. He's alive. Don't just cower away here in this room. And so then over a period of 40 days, then Jesus starts revealing himself uniquely and personally to what we would find even in historical research, 500 at least different people, starting with his remaining 11 disciples. And this is where we pick up here, verse 18. And it says this, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, thor, go, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Did you know that in this portion of Scripture, that there is an imperative word that is used by Jesus when he says these last words, to his remaining disciples. Now, for those of you who are like me, and you only memorized the definition of words when you needed to pass the quiz or test and vocab, uh, vocabulary tests, and then you immediately forgot what that word means, let me just give you a quick English lesson. Imperative means this. Imperative means giving an authoritative command. Uh, our military people probably know 
this word a lot because they are given imperatives in their career. These are commands that must be followed if we are going to continue to win, fight for freedom. Imperative means this is an authoritative command. And I want to ask us, just to get a little interaction this morning, if you were to guess which word in this portion of Scripture is that imperative word, which one would you guess? Go ahead, you can say something. Go. Go. Make. Anyone else? Baptizing? Teaching? Okay, so now I'm going to give us the answer. Maybe you looked up here and you thought the imperative word was go. And you thought, of course, it has to be the imperative word. Like, if we don't go, if we don't evangelize, if we don't tell people about Jesus, how are they going to know? Go has to be the authoritative command that's used in this portion of Scripture. Well, unfortunately, if you chose go, you selected the wrong option. But maybe I heard somebody shout the word baptize. You thought baptize is the thing. Yes, of course, Jesus wants us to dip some people. He wants us to baptize them in the Holy Spirit because how are these vessels going to get clean if we don't baptize them? If you chose baptize, choice number B, you also were incorrect. I'm so sorry. What an encouraging word, right? To be told that you got things wrong at church. I didn't come here for this. Well, hey, don't worry. There's some hope at the end of all this. If you maybe selected teaching, you're like, there's no way, there's nothing else up here that is imperative. It's got to be teach. If we don't teach people the word of God, if we don't preach this on the side of streets and let them know the truth, how are they going to know that Jesus loves them, died for them, and wants them to have a new life and relationship with him? If we don't teach people, if this Bible, this thing isn't the most imperative thing in our how are they going to know? Well, if you selected choice C, you were also incorrect. And so some of your surprise, I even gave you a cheat sheet up here. Like, come on, if you can't see this online, there are two words underlined up here on the screens, and we're going to all say it together. Say it with me. Make disciples. Make disciples is the imperative word that gets translated into the English, which is what we just read. Make disciples. Yeah, the Greeks were a little weird. They use one word that gets translated many words. This is way more elaborate than our simple language here in America. But that's what gets translated into English. One word that is an imperative command. Make disciples. You know what I want you to do, Jesus says, before I leave and sit on the right hand of the throne of God, I want you to catch this. What is the most important thing I need you to do? It's making disciples. This is the first time that we see in Scripture Jesus exclusively command his disciples to do this practice called making disciples. But if we actually look throughout his time with his closest followers, we see him sublimily, it's a hard word to say, sublimily <laughs> share this idea with his guys. You guys remember Peter's story? You remember one of his first disciples that he chose? Matthew 4. Go ahead, throw that up on the screens. Here's Peter's story. He's out there fishing. He's doing his regular career trade thing. And Jesus, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will what? Make you fishers of men. Notice that when Jesus first calls Peter, he didn't say, hey, Peter, Come follow me, and we're going to just have this great time, you and me. He didn't say, hey, Peter, I've got this amazing relationship that I want to start with you, and that's all I want you to focus on. I find it so interesting 
that after Jesus invites Peter to come into his life and to follow him, he actually begins to subliminally share this message of, you know what, a big purpose of this relationship we're starting is going to be about you fishing for other people. Now you still might not be convinced that making disciples is the imperative. So I want to go to another story. It makes me think of uh, the, the one religious teacher. Uh, another way to put it into context that maybe we understand it was a pastor like me of the time. Jesus is just doing his thing. And in Matthew 22, this religious teacher asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in all the law? We would now know this as the Bible in which we are able to read today. But he asked Jesus, what is the most important thing in all of the Bible? And what does Jesus say to him? He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. And yes, God wants us firstly to understand he has saved us for a relationship with him. He didn't save us just for a job. So as I talk about what we're focusing in on this morning, let's not make a mistake that Jesus has first called us to be sons and daughters of the King, the creator of all of the universe. And that's what makes him so much more different than any other God that promotes himself to you and to me. He has called us firstly to love him, to come into a relationship with him. He says, this is the grace, this is the great and first commandment. But there's a second that is like it. It's as if he's saying, this is just as important, though, that I need you to catch. And it's this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he finishes saying, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You might be wondering, why am I putting so much emphasis on this making disciple thing? Well, studies show recently from Barna Research Group, this is a very credible Christian research ministry that dedicates their time just to help us figure out how can we be more effective in loving God, loving people. I found this quite staggering. Every two out of five Jesus followers would say they are not actively engaged in discipleship. This means that there is 39% 39% of Christians right here in the United States that have never gotten a taste of this thing Jesus clearly commands we ought to be engaged in as followers of Jesus. But you want to know what's interesting? This same study showed us this. The top reason why people are not engaged in discipleship is this. They just didn't know it was something they were supposed to ask for or to give to somebody else. They just didn't know that this was something that Jesus wanted us to step into when we enter into this relationship with him. And this just now makes me wonder, how did we get to this point? How did we get to this point we're almost half of Christians now. Almost half are not engaging in something Jesus clearly thought was a really great idea for us to grow and build our faith. But not just our own, but the faith of other people. I wonder if we got into this point where two out of every five followers of Jesus are not engaged in discipleship because maybe like some of my teammates, we as followers of Jesus made summer training an option. Maybe you were like me. Maybe you can resonate with that statistic where I said the top reason why people aren't engaged in discipleship is just because they didn't know it was something that you were invited into. For 
you're taking notes, write this down. This is what I want us to catch this morning. Discipleship is not an option. Discipleship is not an option. Again, remember, this is an imperative thing that we have to practice as followers of Jesus to stay close to him, to be more like him. Discipleship was never meant to be an option in my life or yours as we say yes to wanting to follow follow Jesus for the rest of our lives. And I want to encourage us as a church we can't we can't keep making discipleship an option in your life. Like let's not think about anybody else here in the room. Maybe you aren't engaged in this idea that I am sharing this morning, either being discipled or discipling others. But we can't make discipleship one of those optional categories in our life. Why? I got a few reasons why. One, if we don't practice discipleship, we'll become more like a charity than be the church. We'll become more like a charity then we'll be the church. You know what makes us different from the rest of these great charities that are doing wonderful things for the world is we have this next step when you want to start a relationship with Jesus to actually get into a community of believers who are just a few or many steps ahead and they can help show you how to stay close in a growing faith and relationship with Jesus. It doesn't just stop with us handing you a water bottle. It doesn't just stop with us meeting your needs. It doesn't just stop with you showing up to some Sunday service. There is more to this faith that we have given our whole lives to. If we don't practice discipleship as followers of Jesus, we'll just be like every other charity and we'll stop being the church. Another reason why, if we stop practicing discipleship, I think we will promote that Christianity is this solo, learn how to do it yourself religion. Maybe you are like me and I grew up thinking, I guess I just got to figure this out on my own. I guess following Jesus is all on me. And don't get me wrong, we believe and we teach that your personal growth as it relates to your relationship with Jesus is 100% on two people, you and Jesus. But the process that he has invited you to get closer to him is within this context of Christian community. Discipleship was never to be meant to be a solo sport. This isn't golf. It's a team sport. And there are some great coaches. There are some great players who have been following Jesus right here in our community that Jesus wants you to get connected to. And those who are ahead, those who have matured as it comes to following Jesus, there are some new believers. There are some believers who are still at the beginning stages of their faith that are waiting for you to coach them, to guide them to invite them in to this beautiful thing we call discipleship. Discipleship is also one of those things that doesn't just build your faith, but it builds the faith of others. That's where we have to graduate from, man of church, is where this thing is just about me and Jesus and me getting closer to Jesus. One of the greatest faith building blocks he's ever given us is you showing others how to get to where Jesus has gotten you. And the last reason why I think we can't make discipleship an option is this. Very clearly, Matthew 28, if you could throw that back up on the screen. Matthew 28, go and make disciples. This is the strategy of how we're going to reach all nations. It isn't more services. It isn't more Christian activity that you just throw into your life. It's this 
beautiful practice of you making disciples that will always be the greatest outreach strategy that we could ever invite people who still don't know him to be convinced that this is something that they're missing from their life. So let's just quickly define what discipleship is because maybe you're still lost. Okay, I get the idea. Discipleship is not an option, but what is discipleship? Well, let's look at Paul's take on discipleship. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. You want to know what discipleship is? It's as simple as this. Those of us who have follow Jesus for a little while, we become a little bit more like him, we actually invite people into our lives. Write this down. Discipleship is inviting someone into your life to follow you as you follow Jesus. Discipleship is not just this extra meeting we add into our calendar, but let's think about discipleship like this. I'm inviting you into my calendar. Discipleship isn't just, I'm inviting you into my small group. Hey, I'm inviting you to be like a kid in my life who I'm going to help raise you spiritually. Discipleship, write this down, is more than a program you sign up for, and it's more than a weekly meeting you attend. Discipleship is more than a program that you sign up for and more than a weekly meeting that you attend. Too often, I think we approach discipleship like it's a task that we just have to add to our Christian duties. But imagine if we approach raising our own biological children the same way we approach discipleship. All right, kid, just do this, do this, and do this. I'll see you in a week, all right? Don't die. I'll be back, all right? You go off, you live your life. Oh yeah, Jesus, I love you. It's so great. This is awesome. And this is all wonderful here, right? Like you're getting closer to Jesus. And hopefully you've got somebody who you're following their example to get you closer to him. But then, oh, what's all this mess? How did you get here? All right, well, if you just do this, and then if you do this, you do this. All right, we'll meet next week. All right. Before you even walk off, there's another mess, right? Like imagine if we approach raising our own kids the same way that maybe we approach this idea of discipleship. No wonder people don't want to be a part of the church. No wonder following Jesus isn't this huge appeal to people who don't know him. Because if we invite people to just show up for a Sunday service, or even if we just invite people into a small group where we only interact with them once a week, Even if that, why would I sign up for this? Why would I want to give my life to this? We can't leave people on their own expecting them to figure it all out on their own anymore. I think we have a problem within the church globally where we have settled for just come to my Christian program on Sunday and hopefully you get more connected to that. But people just keep showing up for Sunday waiting for what's next, but they just don't know where to go. But you know how we fix this problem, man of church? We stop making something that we have maybe made optional in our lives, no longer an option. We no longer create the great commission to be the great option that Jesus has given us. But we take seriously These last words Jesus shared for his remaining 11 that are just as imperative for you and for me. So where do we go from here? Two quick applications. First, you need to pick someone to disciple. I know that's just like super revelatory, super crazy idea. You need to pick someone to disciple. If you look behind you and you don't see anybody following you, that's a good first step to do. Pick someone to disciple. Look at Mark 3, verse 13 has to say. 
And he, being Jesus, went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. Notice that it says Jesus called to them. I think some of us are waiting for people to ask us to disciple them. But if we really follow Jesus' example, even if we look at the story on how he got the 12, he didn't wait for them to ask to follow him. He picked them. He picked them. So we need to stop waiting for people to come begging us that we would invite them into our lives to help them get closer to Jesus. I have a theory. Jesus said one time, I only do what I hear the Father saying, and I only do what I see the Father doing. You want to know how to pick your disciples? I think if we pray first and we hear who he might want you to invite into your life, that's a good place to start before you start picking who you want to show how to follow Jesus. For those of us who would consider us mature, stop making discipleship an option. Stop waiting around for people to pick you. God's matured you so you could pick other people. Now I want to speak to those who maybe be new to the faith. Or maybe you feel like I'm still at these early beginnings of my journey. This is going to sound completely counterproductive to what I just said to the people who need to start picking someone. But what you need to do, be a disciple. Pick someone to follow. If we really want to mature and get to this Jesus and know him more and experience him in a way that continues to transform our lives, we also, those who are called to follow someone, just don't wait for them to pick you. You be praying too. Ask God, who is somebody in my life, in my faith community, I could ask to follow because I want to be like them because they look a lot like you. Don't wait around for other people to pick you. Oh, you're not off the hook. You're not off the hook. So in other words, what I'm saying is we need to get better at praying first and then picking each other if we aren't engaged in this process called discipleship. Because again, following Jesus was never meant to be a solo sport. We were called to do this within a community of people. And we have been graced with amazing giants of the faith right here at Manor Church. Online, there's amazing giants of faith right there at your microsite. But let's stop making discipleship an option. Because imagine what our church would look like if we took seriously this command of discipleship. Imagine if we said, you know what? It's not an option anymore, Jesus. What would happen in your life if you took the risk of saying, I'm going to follow somebody who looks a lot like Jesus? One, I see marriages restored. Two, I see addictions being broken and you truly being set free. I see a church of people who is building these habits on their own because they have a coach who's helping them figure out how do I read the Bible? How do I even understand this thing? A church that's praying because they don't just have to figure it out on their own anymore, but they've had somebody help them figure out how they get a hold of the presence of God and to talk to him about everything and anything. I see a church that is growing beyond the the room of people we have now because we have taken seriously this idea, this outreach strategy to make disciples right here, right where we're at in this time. Let's stop making discipleship an option. But today, let's dedicate ourselves to really finding out who can I start or who, who can I begin to follow for those of us who have just never engaged in helping somebody find Jesus, 
who is somebody here that Jesus would have me connect with and to show them how to stay close to him. Will you pray with me, church? Jesus, we love you. And we thank you for this beautiful thing, this beautiful mission you've given us called the discipleship. And Lord, we, we are grateful that we don't have to do this on our own. So we ask that you would come and that you would speak to us even now. Who is somebody I should pick or who is somebody I should follow right here in Mana Church? Because I want to get to know you better. I want to grow closer to you. I want to experience you. Jesus, would we no longer make this an option? But would we be a church that takes seriously this wonderful strategy that you've given us to continue to change our lives and ultimately change the world? In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen, amen. If you could keep your heads bowed, one more moment. Eyes closed for one more prayer. Maybe you're here this morning and you're like, wow, this is a great talk. But I, I wouldn't even say I've been convinced of being a follower of Jesus yet. Well, can I let you know of some really bad but also some really good news? Start with the bad first one. Just like me, all of us start from this place of being separated from God because we all have the same problem. It's called sin. And sin is not just these behaviors. It's not just these lifestyles that we choose to have, think, say, do. But it's a condition of the heart. Sin has separated us from experiencing a life-giving life-changing relationship with our Creator. And what's even worse is there's nothing that we could do to get ourselves back to Him to be made right and to enter in this relationship with Him. But here's the good news. The good news is this. That God Himself seeing us trying to get back to Him said, I'm going to make a way. So He Himself came in the flesh and his name was Jesus. And he lived the life that we should have lived perfectly. And then he died the death that we deserve to pay for our sin on the cross. But three days later, he rose back to life, securing a new way, the only way to get back to him. That does not require us to strive. It doesn't require us to thrive in doing all these good things. But it just simply requires us to understand that we need this Savior, we need this King, who has paid it all, past, present, and future. Scripture tells us if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart, Christ was raised from the dead. If we believe and we confess these things, we will be saved. We will be able to enter into that one way back to God and experience a life-changing, fulfilling, purpose-filled life. And all we have to simply do is admit that we need Him. So if that's you, what I'm going to simply ask is that you raise your hand so I know who we get to pray with. And don't worry, we're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to call you out. We just want to simply know who we're going to be helping take this next step. So if you want to raise your hand to start a relationship with Jesus, you can go ahead and do that now. All right, you can put your hands down. And uh, like I said, we're, we're going to do this all together. We're not going to embarrass you and single you out. So I need everybody in this room to repeat after me. Say, Jesus, Jesus. Thank, you thank you for dying, dying. for me. I'm a sinner saved by your grace. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And I'll follow you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen.